Hey, Team Healthy. Well, all right. You know that I like to get some good guests here to talk about the subject of narcissism, and uh, we've got the best of the best here with us today. Uh, okay, uh, Dr. Romani Dravasolo, we're so glad to have you with us here. So I just want to uh, say that you've been on the program here before with our Team Healthy at Surviving Narcissism. You're back again. You have a brand new book. We're going to be talking about that. But thanks so much for, for being with us once again. I hope things are well with you. They're, they're great, Les. The book, my book just came out. And, you know, again, I'm so happy. It became a New York Times bestseller, which for me is happy at two levels. One, you're always happy you write a book. It gets out there in the world. But the other reason I'm happy, and I think it's something you'll resonate with, is it means this issue is finally getting some attention and traction. I think a lot of folks who go through this feel very alone in it. People saying, is this even really a thing? It's got to be a thing if this many people are turning their head towards it. To me, this it's almost like this commercial indicator that this is an issue and people have to start paying attention to it. And so I'm really in a, I'm sad it's happening, but I'm heartened to see it's getting attention because I want people to feel less alone with it. Well, and, and, and I echo your thought on that. It's just so amazing that uh, as you and I and others talk about the topic, I mean, it, it, it hits a raw nerve with a lot of people, doesn't it? Yeah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it is. I think it's for many people, it's the puzzle piece that once it clicks into place, so much else makes sense in their lives because they've invested so much of themselves in trying to rationalize these harmful behaviors or make sense of them or take the blame onto themselves, all the usual stuff. But once this sort of this this guidebook is given to them, they're saying, "Oh my gosh!" Like, how could they're like they're like you? Well, you haven't been living in my house, so you wrote a book, which means this is not about just me. And I think people will say, just knowing this had a name, it has an architecture to it. It has, it is a, it's a thing was enough for some people to say, okay, number one, because I always say this and something I've been coming back to more and more. We often talk about people having a broken heart after a narcissistic relationship and broken hearts are painful. Don't get me wrong, but a broken heart is no match for being made to feel crazy. And that's what happens to people in narcissistic relationships. They're like the broken heart piece that they're like that, that ship has sailed a long time ago, but they're like, I literally feel insane. And to me, the work of helping people with narcissistic who've gone through narcissistic relationships is to return them back to the sense of you're not crazy. There's yeah, not something you're not wrong crazy with and you. you're not alone. Yeah. You're not alone. And now you feel, okay, now you're on more stable ground. Like I said, broken. The one advantage shrinks always have, I say, in the broken heart marketplace is I'm like, give a broken heart six weeks to eight weeks, maybe even three months. They're always going to resolve. But the feeling crazy part, that doesn't go away until somebody gives you, again, a blueprint, a map, a way to kind of navigate out of the mess. Speaking of blueprints, now, uh, for those of you who have been living under the ro uh, rock for the last month and haven't uh, picked up on the book yet, uh, Romani, you got the, uh, the new book, It's Not You. Hey, I I've got to tell you a funny story, okay? Um, I mean, this is like two, three days ago. I was talking with my wife, Jennifer, about a, a topic that I wanted to, to put, a, put together with a video. And so as I began talking with her about the video, you know what her comment was? Well, I just saw a video that Dr. Romney did, and she started talking about all the stuff that you were doing, and, and she just went on and on. And what I want to say, um, honey, uh, back to my original topic. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jennifer, for being a fan. <laughs> well, you, you. You're, you're inside my house, and you're getting, you're, you're. It's like, okay, Jennifer, honey, okay, just, just <laughs> know that I have a little bit of an ego still. <laughs> <laughs> Give Jennifer a big hug from me, though. Thank you. <laughs> so I thought you'd get a kick out of that. But sure enough, you've got your new book. And I wanted to, to talk with you about some of the things that you bring out in the book. Mm -hmm. And um, obviously, I mean, you're going to uh, give the uh, the, the uh, beginning description of what we're talking about with narcissism. But one of the things I wanted to discuss with you today, because there are so many subcategories to this, and that is narcissists. Uh, use strategies, if you will. They have tactics, they have their patterns that they uh, get into, going back to your term, that, uh, that take you into your crazy making. Mm -hmm. And I'd like for you to just kind of uh, walk us through some of the things that they'll do that's part of their strategy mm -hmm. to make you think, well, it's all about you, you're nuts, you're crazy. What would mm -hmm. And the, the first strategy you mentioned in the book uh, is uh, is the strategy of gaslighting. But let, let's talk about that. And then I want to add to a whole lot more uh, of mm -hmm. what you have there in the book. So mm -hmm. can, can you help us understand that? 
Yeah. So remember, these are these are relationships that, you know, Dr. Jennifer Fried put it beautifully when she said they're asymmetric relationships. Narcissistic person never wants a relationship where you're on equal footing. So let's say you start there, right? You're equally empowered to them in the world. You're doing well. They're going to try to they're going to try to change that leveling up because narcissistic folks are very much motivated by power, dominance, and control in a relationship. Now, if you're not aware of that and you're coming into a relationship wanting affiliation, connection, and love, you the two, one of you is playing checkers and one of you is playing chess. Let's put it that way. So it's a very, very different set of rules. And probably the most classical way that a person can create a sense of domination in a relationship by destabilizing someone is by gaslighting them, right? You're not only doubting perceptions, reality, experience, and memories, you're then telling someone that there's something wrong with you. But we also have to remember, Les, that there's a a chapter one in the narcissistic relationship. Nobody's opener is gaslighting. Their opener is charm, charisma, confidence, connection. They actually can be very attuned in the beginning of a relationship. Now, Which it's act, not actually is a part of the gaslighting, though, right? Yeah. I, I it's agree. It's a prelude to it, let's say. It's a prelude to it because what they're doing is one of the essential ingredients to gaslighting is gaslighting is predicated on trust or or connection or attachment. We want to be close to the gaslighter. It's the only way it can work. Because if a stranger gaslighted me or someone I don't care about, I'm like, no, not true. Like, leave me alone. Get the hell away from me. I could take that stance. But if it's someone I love or care about, I'm not going to be as dismissive. And in fact, because I trust them, there's going to be some plausibility, I would assume, to what they're saying. So that front end approach, I agree with you. It's like a takeoff ramp. They're, 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 they're kind of getting the, the field ready. They're fertilizing it and tilling it to be able to get it ready to be able to gaslight you. So that that trust building, whether it's through love bombing, whether it's through idealization, even if it's whether them selling you a sad sack story and you feel the need to rescue them, however they create that connection with you, it all depends on who we are and what leads us to connect. Then that sets the ground for where we are now someone who, when they start to gaslight us, even initially though, we do know that when people in the early phases of gaslighting, people initially fight back. They'll say, uh-uh, uh, -uh, -uh. That, that is absolutely not true. And we push back. The problem is, and if you look at Robin Stern's work, she's, you know, she's written a lot about gaslighting, the gaslight effect and all of that. You know, she also talks about this process. I talk about a similar process, but really how it's in generally in narcissistic relationships. She talks about gaslighting regardless of what the personality is of the person, but we do push back. The challenge is that when we push back, gaslighting isn't lying. Right. If we catch someone in a lie and we give them the evidence of the lie, then the gaslight, a liar is going to say, OK, you got me. I'm sorry. All right. And, and they'll sort of cop to it. Gaslighters are never going to cop to it because they're running a different game. They're not trying to deny evidence. They're trying to dismantle you. So you'll fight back and they will push back. But here's where it gets interesting in a narcissistic relationship, especially one that you want to have sustained is that if you push back a lot, especially early in the relationship, as many of us do, they will then doubt your commitment and may even say like, ah, oh, you know what, like maybe we're not compatible, maybe we're not vibing, and they threaten abandonment. And that threat of abandonment is one of those gaslighting tools that they're almost testing the waters. Now, if you knew what narcissism and gaslighting were, and somebody's gaslighting you and having that argument with you and then saying they're going to go, if you were lucky, you'd say bye, and then you would have, that's it, it's all over. They're probably going to come back though. But most of us don't want it to end and our own abandonment wounds get activated. So many of us at that point will start to relent. The first time we relent, now the gaslighter knows I got, I got a live one here. And they're going to keep pushing this game. But over time, we start doubting ourselves. We start believing the things they say to us like we're crazy and all of that. And that's how that pattern sticks. I, I, actually, I, I I highlighted a quote, and you you were almost uh, saying it word for word. There, uh, you were saying that gaslighting is not a disagreement; it's not lying. Anyone who's ever tried to show a gaslighter evidence, such as text messages, video footage, etc., uh, knows that it doesn't lead to the narcissist person, narcissistic person, taking responsibility. Uh, 
And uh, what you're what you're wanting to do is you uh, you're uh, particularly if you're in an earlier phase with that narcissist, it's like, hey, look, let's just you and me uh, have some good understanding of who we are. I'll be responsible for me. You be responsible for you. And that's a mistake right there. Uh, you, you assume mutuality. And it's not going to happen. They don't want to have to be responsible for themselves. They want to make you responsible mm -hmm. for who they are. And that, of course, is uh, just right at the heart of what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And and I think that that's why it is such a core dynamic. But it is a form of manipulation. I think the bigger umbrella that gaslighting lives under is manipulation. And not all manipulation is gaslighting. Gaslighting yes. is a form of manipulation, but not ver vice versa. Okay. Now, you you, uh, you talked about another strategy that they use, and you call it the dimmer strategy, mm -hmm. D-I-M-M-E-R. Uh, tell us what that's all about. So dimmer, I, I came up with it because these narcissistic relationships dim our light, but it's it's the dismissiveness, the invalidation, the manipulation, the minimization, the entitlement, the rage. What these things do is they basically indoctrinate a person in a narcissistic relationship to basically turn down our true selves because we're going to constantly be shut down. Mm -hmm. Now, you might think, some of you might think, well, I'm a fighter. I would fight all this stuff. Okay, then the relationship will remain volatile, but there's going to be a point at which most people are going to get exhausted and the manipulations will feel plausible. And you just, and again, it's not their opener. By the time these patterns start showing up in earnest, the devaluation, the minimization, all of that, we've sort of got some buy-in. It's that sunk cost. We're They've in got the relationship. You on the hook. Yeah. And the trauma bonding has really sort of set in. I always say like the jello is no longer liquid. It's holding its form. And that's really sort of that trauma bonded state. We, we, we're sort of now starting to fight for this. And keep in mind too, unless it's a distinction I make in the book, I'm sure it's something you've encountered in your work. The mistake we make is when we keep asking the question of who is attracted to a narcissist and who are narcissistic people attracted to? It's the wrong question because this is not happening at the attraction level. The bigger question is who's getting stuck in these relationships because that's where the problems begin, right? Attra who's not going to be attracted to someone charming, confident, and charismatic, and they're attracted to us because we're a supply. But the people who get stuck tend to be people who are more empathic and flexible and um, forgiving and optimistic and believe in the potential of people to change and might be rescuers and fixers and who keep trying to make it better. Folks like that are going to stay in it and actually also be more vulnerable to things like the gaslighting because of that mental flexibility kind of hurts us in this circumstance. We'll say, well, I guess I could be responsible for that. Somebody who might actually not have those qualities might be a little more likely to say, I'm out of here. Like this is no, I'm yeah. not doing this. And so those, it's not about getting in. It's about the staying in. And those qualities in us that are actually very healthy qualities and pro-social like empathy, like warmth and kindness and compromise, those things actually hurt a person immeasurably in one of these relationships. And when we think even of things like minimization, a great example of minimization is something we see in gaslighting, which is mockery. They'll tease. There's a lot of teasing that happens. Like, you know, oh, you think, you, you think you're all that? Or like, gosh, anyone can do that, roll, I roll. And a person will think, it's like, this kind of feels mean, but if you bring it up to the narcissistic person, they'll say, oh, get over yourself, grow up. I'm just, I'm just having some fun. And now you feel ridiculous because you were getting hurt by a joke. And they said, yeah, I told you you were too sensitive. So these things again, <laughs> that yeah. feel plausible, then all of a sudden we are able to internalize as, mm, yeah, maybe I am too sensitive. Maybe I'm being ridiculous. Maybe I need to be more thick skinned. And, and then they gotcha. All the while they're, they're whittling away at your own mm -hmm. well being you know uh, one of my books is uh, when pleasing you is killing me yep uh, and you, you get into that high appeasement mode and it's like hey look mm -hmm. if we're having tension i don't really like to have tension and uh, and you you want to be a pleaser and uh, you want to be a bridge builder and best case scenario that can be good until the narcissist thinks i can make this work for me yep and that's, right. uh, that's what we have there. So, so when you talk about the the dimmer pattern, you talk about all the diminishment, etc. But then, what about the, uh, the the dominance theme? Uh, right. So the, that they go into. Yeah, and you, I'm, you know I'm, that's I'm, on its way. Yeah, yeah. So the dominant the dominance patterns are it's it's very much about control, 
right? It is about, it's going to be my way. And some of this happens through isolation. Now we know less that this is all on a continuum at the extreme ends of, of narcissism and narcissistic abuse. We're seeing malignant narcissistic relationships, coercive control, that kind of thing. But even in the middle, really what my book's about, these more moderate narcissistic relationships, isolation is part of the story. And the isolation may be, for example, them dropping in little sprinkles about like, I don't know if you should trust that friend or like your friend doesn't like me or, you know, why do you put up with your mother talking to you like that? But these are actually often solid sources of support. And the narcissistic person will often try to put small or big wedges between you and validating voices in your life. And especially in early days, when you're trying to preserve the relationship with the narcissistic person, these, again, you buy into the wedges and you get more and more isolated from the most important anti-gaslighting tool we've got, which are validating voices. Let me ask you something, because what you said just uh, uh, sparked something for me. What, one of the things that makes it most difficult when you're trying to discern, is this person I'm with healthy or not, is um, like you say, you may be picking up on something that you don't like, you know, the complaining about your mother, etc. cetera. Um, but somehow the narcissist has a really good skill, if you want to call it that, of making you doubt your good perceptions. Correct. Mm -hmm. And over a while, over time, it's like, how did you come up with that? Or no, 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 you were misreading that. And I guess when you're exposed to those kind of invalidating comments, over time, it has its effect uh, in uh, to the narcissist's benefit. And uh, that's that's part of the whole uh, main uh, uh, thing they want to maintain. They want to maintain that dominance by getting you to not trust your intuitions. Right, and because but they hit, but the narcissistic person's hitting two parts of us: a healthy part and an unhealthy part. The unhealthy part is our self doubt. Right, people who stay in narcissistic relationships longer either have a standing history of self doubt or it's been developed in the relationship. The healthy part of us, though, they're hitting is our flexibility. Right, Fle mentally flexible people are able to see situations from different perspectives. But when you put the self doubt and the flexibility together. When the narcissistic person starts putting in those plausible doubts, you're able to see the plausibility like, well, yeah, my mom can be a handful and maybe he's right. Maybe I'm holding myself back because I keep spending time with my mom. And so things that might even be very fuzzy hypotheses for you, because no relationship's perfect, that all of a sudden now they start becoming more concrete. But the big problem is the more isolated we get the more dominatable we get. And also narcissistic folks are very much, they're menacers. They, they're very, um, and they're very vindictive. And even before you get to that part of the relationship with them where things are falling apart, you'll see their vindictiveness come out towards other people. They'll even say it, they'll be like, oh, well, let me tell you this, nobody wants to get on the wrong side of me or they're gonna have hell to pay. And there's this sort of sense of like, well, that's not applicable to me. But then one day you're like, oh my gosh, this I'm is now about me, <laughs> I'm next, exactly. Yeah. And I think that that vindictiveness, which is very much an ego thing for narcissistic people, that they they cannot tolerate that idea of an ego injury. So they're going to rage at, as Kohut would write, they're going to rage at that person who brought up that ego injury. And that feels, and it is, it's revenge and post-separation abuse is very often perpetrated by narcissistic people when relationships don't go the way that they want. So gaslighting, the dimming, the domination, and then what you're describing there is another of the patterns that you highlight in your book, and that is the, uh, the just the, the ongoing disagreeable pattern. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's where it's like yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, no, the, the arguing and the bickering mm -hmm. and the, uh, the griping and no, 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 I don't know why you would think that and you did that yesterday. I mean, yeah, talk about how that begins to emerge. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that <laughs> that narcissistic people love fighting. They're good at it because conflict is a place to win, right? Narcissistic folks by nature are very competitive. And so in order to keep that upper hand, conflict actually sets up that opportunity. So these relationships will be very argumentative. And many people in narcissistic relationships will say, Conflict is not, it, it actually feels very unsafe for them. Some people like conflict, but a lot of folks stuck in these relationships don't. Narcissistic people also engage in a lot of baiting. If you're not argumentative, they're going to pull you into an argument, right? So they're going to just sort of poke until you finally pop. And frankly, when you pop is exactly when they'll turn around and say, gosh, you're so sensitive. And so that's, more, it's almost like they're setting the gaslight up. They're teeing it up. There's also a lot of blame. <coughs> Excuse me, let me stick up. Is there? Mm.
there's also a lot of blame shifting. So they will, you will, they, you will ask for accountability. Again, in the early days of a narcissistic relationship, we navigate it as though it's a normal, healthy relationship. So we expect people to take responsibility for when they do things. And repeatedly, you'll start to see they will blame you for everything. I mean, even if it's a physically abusive relationship, they'll blame you for them hitting you. Or if they are un unfaithful to you, they'll blame you. They'll say, well, you weren't paying enough attention to me. They will blame you for their betrayal or their transgression or their harm. There's also a lot of criticism in these relationships, and these can be big digs or small digs. It feels like you can't do anything right. And a lot of that is also a byproduct of the projected perfectionism that a narcissistic person places on a partner or someone close to them. Like you really start to believe if you got it perfect enough, then this would work out. And these are also relationships that are riddled with contempt. There's over time, especially when you start cycling more into the discard phase, it's almost like they're disgusted by you. Like, ugh can't believe I have to listen to you, talk to you, be with you, but they don't cut you loose because you're a source of supply. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and uh, you mentioned also there's a betrayal pattern too, where, because, mm -hmm. because everything you're talking about has just this uh, dishonest stench to it. Yes. Yep. And mm -hmm. uh, of course, if you call them out on that, they're going to say, well, if anybody's dishonest in this equation, it ain't me. Uh, so, but when we talk about betrayal, uh, th there can be a lot of lying or, um, you know, misrepresentation of what happened. And then you, you also mentioned that there's future faking. Uh, mm -hmm. What's all that about? Mm -hmm. So it is, again, the, the future faking is when the narcissistic person makes a promise that is linked to a future date. Um, I'm going to go to therapy and I'm going to change. Um, we're going to have a baby once X, Y, or Z happens. Um, we will go visit your next year. We'll have Thanksgiving with your family. What they, what, what's so diabolical about these relationships is the narcissistic person is listening enough to know what matters to you. They do. They're listening to it, but they're filing it away like data. So when they need something from you, they, retrieve it and they weaponize it as a future promise. And that's going to keep you in the relationship another six months, another year, heck, sometimes for 20 years. Once I retire, then we will. And that could be 20 years down the road. And people, again, who are kind and agreeable and warm who are in these relationships will think, well, I can't expect them to go to therapy tomorrow and change overnight. And now you've bought into it. And now they'll take they may not ever go into therapy. It'll take five months to find someone. And if you question them, then we see the disagreeableness again. Really, do you expect I'm going to make these changes overnight? God, you're so unrealistic and demanding, Gaslight. Now you're the problem. <laughs> you're the one who's demanding. But going back to the general sense of betrayal, you know, again, looking at Dr. Jennifer Fried's work, she's written beautifully on this whole idea of betrayal trauma. This idea that the, the betrayals, the accumulated betrayals by a person who had who we believe or who has proclaimed to trust that we that lo they love us and that we trust them when betrayals are committed by someone whom we believe loves or trusts us it has a very specific series of psychological effects on us and it creates a tremendous sense of loss of psychological safety and people who go through betrayal trauma almost invariably start to blame themselves and cord and often almost dissociate from the repeated betrayals because it's the only way to maintain the attachment in the relationship. So when you understand betrayal trauma, you understand one of the core sort of dynamics of what's happening in a narcissistic relationship. And many people won't even sort of code it as betrayal. They're code, ah, relationships are hard, or oh, I haven't been available since the kids were born, or you, you people take it on. But more than anything, they also sort of file away, but put away at a place they can't find those sorts of betrayal experiences. But all of these things from the false promises to the moving the goalposts to whatever it is, there's also, again, that sunk cost piece stuck to the trauma bonded piece where you now feel like you've put so much time into this that you keep trying to fix it. But the fact is, Les, the more we're betrayed, even if we cut off those betrayed pieces, we we dissociate from them, we file them away, we put them away, what Fried calls, gen uh, what Fried calls betrayal blindness, that doesn't come without a cost. The more we do that, the sicker we get. We get anxious, we get depressed, we we feel disconnected from ourselves, we may get physically ill. So those accumulated betrayals, like I said, we don't always register them because it might mean then we have to step away or reassess the relationship. We then get sick. Well, and the sad thing is, as you begin to uh, illustrate or show some of those um, 
re reactions, whether it's the anxiety or depression, and very often the anger and the agitation, then guess what happens? <laughs> Look at you. I mean, it's it's the ultimate yep. gotcha game. It's exactly, exactly. Yep. Yeah. And then in the end, uh, uh, so many times, and I know you mentioned this also in your book, one of the things that begins to happen as a result of so much of what you're describing already, you wind up feeling more and more isolated. You begin, like you say, you begin to doubt yourself. You pull away from those that would love you or have been part of your support system. And the narcissist is thinking, this is working for me. Mm -hmm. And and it's it's all part of that pattern of uh, dysregulating you. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, so much of what you're saying today here, Romney, uh, the, the implication is it, it's so important for the narcissist to uh, to more or less imply you need to learn how to trust me. And if that's not happening, you're not trusting me well enough. And uh, the, and it's it's like if you have a different opinion or a preference or interpretation, it can't possibly be right. And right. I know one of the things that you and I both we uh, we work with people to to uh, to, to recapture is no if you're if you're picking up on something you need to start listening to what your gut's telling you mm -hmm. as opposed mm -hmm. to what's being placed in it by this highly dysregulated person and that's so why well, it's so necessary for us to be able to see these patterns in the first place so that you can uh, go back and recoup assuming you ever had it to begin with self trust. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think, again, like you said, it's that it's that game of cat and mouse of human beings have a natural tendency to want to trust. And the fact is, we almost need to trust and we trust yeah. more than we think we do. If we didn't trust, we wouldn't leave the house. We wouldn't get in a car because we wouldn't believe the other person is going to stop at a stop sign. Right. We couldn't function in our lives. And now here is someone we believe we love. So when they're saying you, you, you need to trust me, you have to trust me. At some level, we want to trust them. Yeah. Right. And then it's that, again, that chronic destabilization. It's what Dan Shaw calls that loss of intersubjectivity, that you're not allowed to have a separate reality from mine. It is, if I'm cold, you're cold. If I'm hungry, you're hungry. If I believe in this, you believe in this. And if you if you vary off of that script, you will be shut down. So it is a slow indoctrination where over time, a person is, they, I, I'm sure you've had this experience too, Les. I've got clients who've said to me, I don't know what I want the thermostat set at. I actually don't know what I want to watch on TV. They'll sort of look at all, you know, these days there's a million things to watch and they'll have the remote in their hand. They'll say, I don't know what I like anymore. And yeah. that to me, one of the biggest pieces of healing from these relationships is starting small from pizza toppings to comedy shows you like to thermostat temperatures. It's the old uh, death by a thousand cuts. Uh, oh, very been, much so. Yeah, yeah, when you've been whittled away at for so many different times, at first you want to come uh, uh, kick back, but over time it's like, well, maybe I am the problem because it just mm -hmm. has that uh, that cumulative effect. Mm -hmm. um, talk with us a little bit more about the whole um, buildup that becomes what we refer to as the trauma bond. Mm -hmm. So the, the trauma bond, it's, it's a, a term that's been used by ver various people of the years, people like Patrick Carnes and others have talked about it as this, this almost seemingly unbreakable emotional connection that is created between us and another person be because of the alternation between good and bad experiences. Now, trauma bonds, not, not surprisingly, often can get created in childhood. And it's a sort of a very sort of distorted attachment pattern with a parent where the parent often is unavailable. It's chaotic. They subjugate the child. They bring them into their own service to meet their, their own needs. But every so often the parent gets it right. And the child has no choice but to sort of fall, create a narrative that the parent is good and that they're bad because of that survival need of attachment. Now, fast forward into adulthood, narcissistic relationships are unique in that alternation between some good and bad. And I always say the trauma bond starts when we start in love bombing, we're almost at like 99% good, 1% bad. It's like this person comes and fills all these things we want. As the devalue phase starts, we're at 90% good, 10% bad, 80% good, 20% bad. That the slowly it comes down to 50-50. To me at 50-50 is really when the trauma bond is forming because it's really as bad as it is good. And now you're going to 40, 60, 30, 70, and one day you're at about 10% good, 90% bad. But now that trauma bonded sense of that that the intermittent reinforcement, right? The good old slot machine, that mm -hmm. the one good thing, 
even if it's a breadcrumbed tiny thing, feels like a payout. So yeah. people buy into that relationship. Like, look, look, they said hello to me when they came home today. And you're like, okay, <laughs> good. Yeah, and so yeah. it's a it's the it's the littlest things create the buy-in. And people will say, Yeah, we do keep having you keep having the same fights about the same things that never resolve. People become everything in that relationship. They become the narcissistic person's life coach, personal assistant, butler, cook, you name it. They're serving every role. In essence, they're becoming every reason it works. They've become pulled farther away from their identity. And then what we see is people will say, even as they intellectually understand, like, this is super unhealthy and I've written all the lists and I know this is bad for me, but there's this almost physiological pull. They say, however, yeah. the thought of ending this relationship is filling me with a sense of panic. Hey, hey Romani, uh, when, when you were uh, back in uh, college, uh, did you have the, the same, did you, did you have to do a Skinner box with uh with a rat and do the ex experiences because I we never we, did the inner box. I learned that, that's about where it. I first became a, a familiar yeah. with the term uh, intermittent reinforcement, mm -hmm. where you teach the rat to to push the liver so the liver so they get their drop of saccharin. Then you uh, it's, you make it very predictable at first, but then you make it super erratic, and it, it's amazing uh, how they would just they would go into real yeah exactly, and they would just be uh, so tense and anxious and all and. Uh, of course, then you have to do your write up and, and project it into humanity and all like that. But I mean, I, I'm I was just thinking of my rats in my box uh, when you were talking about that. It, it becomes crazy making, doesn't it? Oh, it's so. great. I mean, listen, walk into a casino floor and look at people with glazed eyes dropping their their weekly paycheck into a machine and pressing a button. Why? Because of that payout. And yeah. at least the slot machine isn't verbally abusing them. I can actually get behind <laughs> the casino <laughs> people and understand that. So, but that intermittent reinforcement yeah. schedule in a relationship is lethal because listen, Less if it was bad, if it was 100% bad, yeah, I still think there'd be some trauma bonding, but there'd yeah. be nothing to hold on to. But it's that when you go from like almost 99% good to almost like to 10 and less percent good, that's where people, they hold on to the old days. I remember working with clients who would say, but 30 years ago, we had this wonderful time in Miami. I'm like, honey, it doesn't even look like that in Miami anymore. Like it's, and yet that one night, like, but we danced so well that night. Night, it 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 that memory is almost yeah. held in present yeah. time, like we see in trauma survivors, right? In trauma survivors, the memory of the past is still held somatically and physiologically as though it's happening now. Yep. Um, okay, now let, let, let's talk in terms of uh, getting away. Now, you and I both agree that uh, you know people say, well, what you need to do is just go no contact. Well, yeah, I mean, if you if you could, uh, that would be nice. But often there's um, there's so many residual elements that go along with it that it's not possible. So uh, when a person is saying, "I need to get away, I need to break free from uh, from all of these patterns that the narcissist is throwing at me," uh, going back to your uh, the title of your book, it's not you. I need to remind myself this is not about me. Uh, I need to remind myself who I'm dealing with here. You can't go no contact necessarily, but what other options might there be if that's the case? Yeah, I mean, I think I'm so glad you brought up that point about no contact is that, yes, it's sort of this, it's held up as this possibility that isn't accessible to most people. I think one of the biggest crossroads, number one, is where a person is still working through, do they think they're going to leave this relationship or they're going to stay in it? Now, this can look differently depending on whether it's a family relationship or an intimate relationship. And we always have to remember, Les, not everyone has the luxury of stepping away. There are reasons ranging from the practical, the financial, safety, minor children, family court is a mess in these cases. Um, from to, again, trauma bonded reasons, hope. I always tell folks, I'm not pulling the pieces of the scaffold away until you're ready. So people still have to make that decision. And from there, I say, you know, listen, I think the low contact kinds of um, strategies can be good, but above all else, it's disengagement. In fact, I often tell clients one of the, sorry, <coughs> It's nice. It's nice to have a, a, a moment where we see that yeah. uh, we're we're human, aren't we? Yo, I might. I've got a cough. That wolf would stop. When we think of the one thing I tell clients is I tell them don't go deep, and by that I mean don't defend, don't engage, don't explain, and don't personalize this. Yes, because I'm saying like when you get into the mud. 
you are never going to get out of it. It's like quicksand. And so just don't engage with them. And conversations where you'd go all the way into the rabbit hole, you're really keeping it a lot more surface level. Not that you're capitulating, but you're like, okay, sure. Or you don't even bring up the tricky topics. In fact, another thing I tell folks is, you don't share good stuff with them. You don't share bad stuff with them. If you have good news, share it with the loving people in your life first, your friends, people who get you might even be might even your therapist and let those people show the sheer joy and happiness mm -hmm. for you. And at some point by the narcissistic person may find out, but you've already experienced the joy of the news and the same with the bad news. Like they will, they will often not be supportive the way you need take it to the places where you can get that support. So you're making a series of decisions. Well, it also means that you can't afford to isolate. That's right. That's exactly right. So the, the, the strategies and tactics are really about disengaging. So this relationship is just really kind of like, you recognize that the relationship is a bridge to something that matters to you, maybe to other family members you care about, maybe for now, because you don't want to, you don't want your minor children to have to split custody time, that these are tactical decisions on your part. You're now using your wise mind to make choices and you're, but you're also not having to deal with like trying to do something as extreme as no contact, which may feel intolerable. Simply the disengagement and seeing it clearly that radical acceptance you and I and all of us talk about is that means you engage with it very differently and you're not, again, repeating the same thing over and over again. And some people will say, listen, I was doing great and I slipped and it went right back to the old, you know, it went exactly the way you said. And I said, I don't think slipping is a bad thing because I think sometimes the slip reminds you this is not changing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, at a time like this, when we're talking about this topic, you hear the word boundaries. And uh, a lot of times people think boundaries means uh, you get to tell people no a lot. And, and sometimes that happens. Uh, I would I would constantly remind my patients, though, uh, boundaries begins with one enormous uh, step, and that is, first, you have to decide who you're going to be. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to get a definition of uh, who you are from the inside out. And one of the things you've been talking about so heavily in our discussion here is uh, narcissists want to rob you of that. Yeah. And they, they want to whittle away at your uh, sense of trust, uh, not just the, in the relationship, but with, within yourself. And so it's going to be so essential for individuals to kind of go back to the basics with the idea that says, uh, now, when I define what it means to be a healthy Les Carter, a healthy uh, Romani Vassala or whoever it might be, what, what does that mean? And what ingredients and in what circumstances? And then you start getting more and more particular mm -hmm. and specific. Uh, and I'm assuming that uh, that that would be something that you would underscore heavily uh, when you're trying to break away, uh, getting them out of your head, but getting you back into the driver's seat. And I think that the getting you back into the driver's seat is is it, it's healing is I think a lot of people miss that healing isn't just you either disengaging from them or getting them fully out of your lives. To me, that's not even that's the first maybe 40% of the journey. The rest of this is like I said, putting, you said, putting yourself in the driver's seat, fully occupying yourself, knowing what you're about, understanding your own vulnerabilities, giving yourself time, listening to your sympathetic nervous system, understanding the messages it's sending to you. And I think that we often shame ourselves for what were very basic psychological safety responses in ourselves, but they were simply trying to keep us safe. And instead of shaming ourselves for them, understand how the patterns in relationships, how these responses evolve be curious about them welcome them in and then don't feel like we are sort of um we are we, we are only there we are in their service that they, these responses run us like and these relationships are psychologically unsafe places so we are often doing things i don't think anyone's anyone who's being run by their sympathetic nervous systems never having their best day let's put it that <laughs> way and so okay. that, that right and so we're, we're always like Ooh, that, i did not like that i said of course you didn't like that because that was not you were under threat and no one that's never going to be our best look you know i, I uh, real quickly before we wrap here i, I go back to uh, to parenting you you talk about uh, building trust. Well, that's obviously an incredibly necessary tool when, uh, you know, the, the parents are uh, connecting with the child. Uh, they show empathy. They uh, they let it be known. Uh, you, I want you to trust me. But then the, the healthy uh, engagement from there goes because I want you to learn how to eventually trust yourself. And and uh, one of the, right. the jobs right. of parenting is to work themselves out of a job. But it's It's a long procedure. And when you begin realizing, okay, that narcissist, uh, it's its not a parenting relationship now, but they want me to trust, but they're not doing it in the uh, the context of bringing out the best in me. 
And when you pick up on that, that's when you know you're with a manipulator, not someone who's truly motivated by love. So uh, it, it's, it's, it's just so necessary for us to see those kind of t- trends and patterns. Oh, absolutely. And if a person's also had a narcissistic parent, that journey back into self-trust is a journey that never began in the first place. From the very beginning, even pre-verbally, yeah. the child, the, none of the child's needs or wants were validated. And the child was very quickly being treated by a parent. The ch- ch- parent was literally personalizing the child's behavior as a child trying to aggravate them when the child was simply being a child. And the child is pathologized at every turn yeah. and really learns that their needs and wants and hopes are all shameful and foolish. Hey, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure we're going to wrap this, but I, I'm sure that you get the same question I get. And that is, uh, why do you keep uh, doing all these different talks and, and coming up with all, all these nuances? And my answer is because I'm excited about growth. And uh, if I can be somebody that is able to you know pull together some ideas and thoughts and concepts that might be helpful to someone else, obviously, I wanted uh, to make sure that I'm consistent with what I'm talking about. But it's so exciting when you get to be on the front edge uh, saying, may I share with you some things that I believe could work for you? And then you begin to see some of the, uh, uh, the results of that. That's got to be super rewarding, isn't it? I think for both of us. I mean, I so admire your work and, and, and the work you do. And, and- what you talk about, what you write about, and others of us in this field doing this, yeah. is that I think that what it is, though, to me, Les, is where I feel like mental health has come up short, is we've often told people, you can figure this all out yourself. It's all inside of you. I'm like, no, 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 no. There's a context happening outside of you. And we need to be able to call that context what it is. It's not that I want people to swim in that forever. I want them ultimately, like you said, putting them in the driver's seat. But we have been asking people to make these changes within themselves without them understanding what they're up against. And I think that's a huge paradigm shift in the field of mental health. Dr. Romney, <laughs> thank you so much for being on the uh, the Surviving Narcissism podcast with us. Uh, you're such a treasure, and uh, you're a friend of our uh, program, and I uh, just know that uh, there's a place for you anytime you want to come over here. And, and by the way, congratulations, New York Times bestseller. And uh, I know it's going to, uh, the book is going to help. And then it, uh, it just uh, increases your uh, sense of uh, being known out there. So congratulations to you. And thanks for spending your time with, uh, with us and our uh, team healthy uh, group that we have here. It was my absolute pleasure. Unless I, I, I wish I had a dime for every person who said, I have been so helped by you and Les Carter. Like we're often just spoken together and they're like, it's just the two of you, you say similar things, but you also say enough different things that it gives us more wisdom. So I think together we've actually helped a lot of folks, even though, even though we've never physically been in the same room. So yeah, I'm what really an honor. honored. I'm very honored. Thank you so much for having me. I'm oh, uh, it's my pleasure and we'll do it again. Okay. I hope so. I hope so. Okay. Thank you, Les. Thank you.